All right, we're finally going to talk about money here in economics. Yes, we've talked about price, but that's a very different concept than money. Um, and I wanted to make sure before we talked about money that we understood some very basic concepts on economics that underlie everything, namely scarcity and supply and demand. And so money really is like the oil that allows our economy to keep functioning. Much like in an engine, gasoline is what makes it move and what powers it. Um, oil, on the other hand, keeps it lubricated and makes things function easier. That's the same function that money has. And we want to start off by talking about the history of money. Uh, money has not always been paper currency like we think of today. In fact, the easiest thing to think about is just two farmers back in the day where one would trade a cow for another. Um, we would trade cattle, livestock, uh, chickens, food. All of these other things can be used as money. And then we have historical changes. Christopher Columbus was not looking for new land. He was looking for a path to get spices because spices were so valuable. And some parts of the world used spices as different forms of currency because you could weigh them, because they were easy to transport, they weren't large, and they were scarce, so that made them valuable. The main thing we've always used as a currency throughout history, the number one thing we've always used as a currency is gold. Gold has some very, very unique features that help. Number one, it's a soft metal, so it's easy to work with. It has a low melting point, so it's easy to shape. It's scarce. You don't find it everywhere. It's unique. There is no other substance that looks like gold. And so it presented an obvious currency for ancient times. One of the problems with gold is in bars. And so how do we transport this? How do we divide it? These issues. And so we, we moved along and progressed to coinage. And what that is is really just taking gold currency and gold bars and melting it down into uniform coins that we can trade. Um, if we use various sizes, if we use different metals, we can come up with different values. Um, coins again get to be heavy and it requires that metal and so as with the penny, sometimes a coin is worth more as the raw metal than it is representing money. And I'll explain what that means in class. We moved on to paper currency. Uh, the first example of the United States using paper currency, I believe, um, in wide circulation is dealing with the Civil War. Um, there's been currency around before that, though. This has some obvious advantages. Number one, they're all the same size. They are easier to transport. You simply change the numbers on it to change the value of it. And the modern currency, which is digital. And that's what makes understanding money a little bit tricky is we're at the point now it's so transparent that money is simply numbers um, that represent value. We never see money that much anymore. For myself, for example, I get a direct deposit check. Um, I pay my bills online. I pay for all my purchases with a card. I almost never see paper currency. Money has a variety of functions that it needs to perform in order to be good at its job and to be money. The first is a medium of exchange. And what we mean by that is a way to trade one good for another. I work and that's what I'm trading, my labor. But I go to Cub and I want to buy food. How do I trade teaching for that? That makes it difficult. And we can see that some of those old um, versions of money don't work very well. And so we can look at the old story of Jack and the Beanstalk and we can see, well, wait a minute. He's going to trade cattle for beans. Well, sounds like a good deal, but what if you only want to trade half a cow? Now we have a problem. If you cut the cow in half, it's not as valuable because... Yes, if you want it for meat, you've now got half the value, but wait a minute, what if you want to trade it for milking? Well, now as soon as you cut it in half, it's not worth anything. If you want to trade it so you can have more cows for breeding, now it doesn't have value. So a cow doesn't divide very easy. The second function of money is a unit of account. In other words, a way to compare the value of goods and services. If I teach for five minutes, how much value is that compared to somebody who works on a car for five minutes? that's very difficult. If I am a tire manufacturer, how much is a tire worth compared to a TV? And so this is where, again, we see a difficulty with older forms of currency. If we grow chickens, I raise chickens, I guess is a better thing. Sorry about that. If we're raising chickens and I want to buy a BMW, how do I figure out the conversion rate? And is the person who's selling a BMW willing to trade me in chickens? This becomes very, very difficult. And so we've had to progress from those older forms of currency. 
The third function of money is it has to store value. In other words, if I work today, or Charlie works today, mowing lawns, and I tell him, well, you're going to take that value of your labor, and you're going to save it for 10 years so that it'll help with college. Well, the money that I get paid has to hold its value. And so what if I'm working for a chicken farmer and he decides to pay me in chickens? Well, then I have dead chickens in 10 years. And that has no value. So we need money that holds its value over a long period of time. In fact, some money, some people, if they're smart about investing, are holding the value of money for, sometimes we're talking, decades. Some people's family has money that they call old money that has literally been around for centuries. So we need that money to hold its value. Well then, if those are the three functions, what makes money good? What makes some type of currency a good use of that? In other words, what makes a good tool? Well, it's easy to divide. In other words, look at paper money. We have all these different denominations. In other words, dollar values, um, all these different numerical values. It's easy to divide. If I have a $20 bill and something is $2, it's easy. You give me a 10 of 5 and 3 ones as change. How do you divide a cow? Well, paper money does have some drawbacks. Is it easy to transport? And most of you will say yes at first, but stop and think about this. If I want to pay for a house, it's $240,000. Do I really want to carry $240,000 around? Number one, I don't feel safe. Number two, depending on the size of currency I get, well, that's hard to carry around. So we invented the checkbook, which is easy to divide because every single purchase I make, I can write out the exact amount on my check. So a checkbook really is just a link to my money at a different location, the bank. And so what I do is I simply tell the customer or the person that I'm purchasing from, I should say, how much I will give them. And I write that denomination in the check. So it's easy to transport because I just carry one single check and I can write it for any and all possible values as opposed to having to have change for the different dollar amounts. Well, the problem with checks is the third thing money needs to be doing. And what we're seeing more and more often is that will other people accept my money as trade? You will all accept money as trade. You won't accept other things. Most of you at your age don't want to take checks because you have to go to the bank or you don't even have a bank account. And so we're seeing more and more of the same sign all around town dealing with checks. And that's they won't accept them. Why? Because all they can do is verify that it's a, an actual live account. They can't immediately get the money out of it. And so that becomes a problem. What did we invent to take care of that? Credit cards. Well, let's talk about this. Is it easy to divide? Yeah, just like checks, I can get the exact amount to the penny that I want to give you. Is it easy to transport? Well, actually, it's completely easy to transport because all I need to do really is memorize those numbers. I don't even need to have the physical card for any transaction that takes place online or over the phone. I just have to know the numbers. Will other people accept it? Yes. More and more people are willing to accept it. Now, not everyone. I can't pay my babysitter by my check card yet, but I will tell you this. There are free apps and there are very, very cheap add-ons that you can use your smartphone to turn it into a credit card reader. So I do think we're seeing the day where very soon fewer and fewer people will use cash at all. Um, i got to be honest, I'm kind of for that. All right, tomorrow we will be working with these and deciding what makes good cons currency and why. Have a good night.